morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this session on the strategic outlook for ASEAN. My name is Warren Fernandez, and I'm editor-in-chief of the Straits Times in Singapore. And uh, this session is jointly organized by the World Economic Forum and the Straits Times in Singapore. And we are very happy to collaborate with REF on this subject because um, covering the strategic outlook of uh, Southeast Asia and the wider Asian region has uh, been our key focus for many, many years. And uh, we've been watching this story um, for, for decades. Uh, some of you will know that the Straits Times was founded in uh, 1845. Uh, during an earlier era of globalization. And it was precisely to track that flow of goods and people and ideas from China through Southeast Asia onto India and Europe and vice versa, passing through that strategic Straits of Malacca, hence the name of the, of the paper, the Straits Times. And this story has been of interest to us over the last few years and decades, especially given the rising economies in our part of the world but also because of the growing strategic tensions between the US and China, which uh, informs uh, much of what we do. My colleagues uh, have been watching this. They do a series of, um, of features called Power Play and also a recent series of videos called Flashpoints Asia. And these are helpfully on the little postcards from Singapore, which you find on your seats for your reference. But this is how the EU president, Ursula von der Leyen, recently characterized the region, Indo-Pacific and Asia. She referred to it as both a thriving region and a theater of tensions. A thriving region, but also a theater of tensions. And she added that the EU wants to play a more active role and take responsibility for the region, which is so vital for our prosperity. So a region full of promise, but not without its perils. And it seems to me that the strategic outlook for ASEAN turns on this question of how we get the balance between being a thriving region as opposed to a theatre of tensions right. And to help me sort of grapple with this, this, this issue, I have a very distinguished panel, a diverse panel. I'm going to introduce them very briefly, uh, starting from my left. First of all, I have Dr. Lin Kwok uh, from the Shangri-La Dialogue, Shangri Dialogue Senior Fellow for Asia Pacific from the Institute of, uh, International Institute for Strategic Studies, the IISS, IISS based in Singapore. Then next to her, I have um, Tunku Tauf Muhammad Taufik, President and Group CEO of Petronas in Malaysia. And then Shinta Vijaya Kamdani, who is Coordinating Vice Chair, Maritime Investment and International Relations at the Indonesia Ch Indonesian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Kadin. And then further down the left, I, we have Matthias Corman, who is Secretary General for the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. And then we are especially delighted today to have with us the Honourable Prime Minister of Cambodia, Hun Sen. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you for joining us. He's also the chair of ASEAN at the moment, and he's told me he wants to sort of be here to, to listen and, and, and absorb the discussion that's going to take place. And then at the end of the proceedings, he will share his thoughts and takeaways of what he will bring home uh, to ASEAN for further discussions uh, in the region. Prime Minister, I hope your trip to Davos has been fruitful and uh, interesting so far, and you've got interesting discussions lined up. We'll be looking forward to hearing your comments. Uh, please. Oh, good. Thank you for your comment, and thank you with the participation from others. Of course, this year, we are proud to be ASEAN Chair in 2022. In fact, ASEAN is 55 years old uh, and has become a community filled with peace, security, stability, innovation and prosperity. ASEAN has also played an important role in political and economic architecture at a regional and global levels. Actually, in addition to recent uh, challenges such as the COVID-19 crisis, the Ukraine war, and the issue in Myanmar, we are all well aware that we are at the critical juncture in the history of the world, where the rule-based international order, supported by multilateral mechanisms, has also been shaken. In this regard, as the ASEAN Chair, Cambodia will focus 
on capturing the rising momentum of ASEAN and making ASEAN to be more vibrant, competitive and attractive through promoting the development of ASEAN community, addressing ASEAN challenges and participating with ASEAN partners in addressing the regional and global common challenges. I look forward to hearing from our panelists here on the strategic outlook on ASEAN. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. We'll come back at the end and hear your final thoughts to wrap up our session. But let me get the discussion going by, by raising the question for Lynn. I'm sure, like many of us, you've been following all the developments that have been taking place back home in Asia while we're all here in Davos. You know, so yesterday we had the launch of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. There were remarks about Taiwan, which has caused a bit of a stir. Um, we've had recently the um, ASEAN-US uh, summit in, in Washington. But there was also the launch of the Global Strategic um, Security Initiative by, by Beijing. And I'd like to get your sense, you know, of all this flurry of activities happening, um, what you make of um, these developments and also what are the, the key challenges facing ASEAN or opportunities, as it may be, uh, to help us get on the right side of that equation of, you know, between being a thriving region as opposed to a theatre of tensions. Thank you, Warren, and thank you everyone for being here today. I'm delighted to be here at Davos, and it's wonderful to see some familiar faces in the room. It's really good to see everyone. Um, I think what you've just outlined, Warren, you know, it represents a flurry of diplomatic um, outreach, uh, both on the part of the United States, but also on the part of China, um, to sort of uh, to seek to engage um, the Southeast Asian region more um, actively, um, to enhance the engagement with the region. And I think this uh, probably sets in context what's going on in the region and also sort of the challenges that um, the region finds itself facing, namely, in a sense, being caught up. It's nice to be wooed by both sides, but also it's, it's not so nice to feel like you have to choose. And I think very often um, Southeast Asian countries, and I'm speaking about Southeast Asian uh, Southeast Asia more generally, because of course the context impacts ASEAN, the institution as well. And Southeast Asian countries, um, often feel like they're caught between a rock and a hard place because they feel like they have to choose um, as US-China competition squeezes the region. Um, they have sometimes felt that um, their strategic options are being narrowed as you know, uh, we see increasing tensions between the United States as well as China. And um, they do not want to have to choose, if I put it quite simply, between the US as a uh, security provider and uh, China as its rainmaker. I mean, it's a little bit more complex than that, than that, but in a sense, that's the dichotomy. US for security, China for not just current economic opportunities, but also future um, economic opportunities as well. So that's one challenge for the region, um, how US-China competition might be squeezing it. Um, the second challenge that I see, and this is less often spoken about, you often hear the region say they do not want to choose, um, but that refrain, in a sense, obscures a deeper-seated concern um, that is related to unlawful and coercive Chinese, um, Chinese actions that we are also seeing in the region, not least in the South China Sea. Um, very Sometimes they push back against it, they make objections, but every... Uh, Quite often, they also just bear it silently. And these actions, unlawful and coercive Chinese actions, pose a real challenge to the region, um, undermines the rules-based order um, uh, that was highlighted by Prime Minister Hun Sen earlier. And it also belies the narrative that we sometimes hear that all will, all, all will be well in the region if not for outsider or Western interference. Um, so that's the second challenge. In terms of a third challenge, so the second challenge I highlighted concerned China. Third challenge relates to the United States. And I think what the US, uh, what the region is increasingly concerned about is a United States that they see as unnecessarily confrontational. Um, and 
and that's necessarily confrontational in terms of its um, relations vis-a-vis -vis China. And I think one clear example of this is the framing of the current competition between the US and China as one between democracies and authoritarian states. And we heard uh, uh, President Biden just talk about that. Um, I think I heard it on the news this morning. So he was saying, this is a competition between democracies versus authoritarian states. But I think that this sort of framing unnecessarily deepens divisions between the United States and China. Um, it makes issues like trade, technology, um, these disputes, it makes it far more difficult uh, to resolve such issue once you throw ideology into the mix, once you start demonizing the other. So that is also very concerning. However, and then unfortunately, I think what we're seeing with the war in Ukraine and um, the China-Russia joint statement that was issued about, about two weeks before the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, what we've seen with that is actually a hardening of uh, geopolitical competition um, around ideological lines, which I think is immensely uh, detrimental. Um, with, you, um, with Russia and China declaring a no limits partnership, we um, are seeing the world threaten to cleave into um, the West versus the rest as you know, liberal democracies seek to align themselves against um, authoritarian states. And I think this leaves much of Southeast Asia in a very uncomfortable position. Um, you have much of Southeast Asia that are either illiberal democracies, backsliding democracies, or an authoritarian states. And many of these countries are actually very important uh, strategic partners for the United States and other countries who are um, um, who seek to promote a rules-based order. So that's a third um, challenge I see for the region. And the fourth challenge is the rise of um, political and security minilaterals uh, that, in a sense, um, go around um, the ASEAN-centered uh, uh, security architecture in the region. And I think this reflects a sense that ASEAN has failed to achieve the strategic interests of the United States and its allies and partners. And of course, I think the US and its allies and partners will, of course, continue to give pay lip service to ASEAN. However, you know, without additional resources being um, devoted to ASEAN, we might uh, see ASEAN by the sidelines. And finally, and I'll, after this, I'll stop. I think the final challenge relates to ASEAN itself. And I think ASEAN um, demonstra has demonstrated a lack of um, unity and a lack of strategic clarity, um, which has relegated it to sitting on the sidelines in its own backyard. And I think two problems lie at the heart of this. Number one, I think China has successfully divided and ruled the region. And number two, I think the region, unfortunately, um, has at times, um, or some countries within the region, have adopted a rather parochial view of their interests. And of course, I'm not saying that you know, countries in the region should um, set aside their national interests and place it at the altar of multilateralism. What I am saying, however, is that for, small, for countries, especially small countries, multilateral, multilateralism and multilateral organizations are an essential means by which countries, particularly small countries, can achieve their national interests. And I think nowhere is this more true than in Southeast Asia, where countries, you know, lie in the shadow of uh, China's, uh, the, of the, uh, lie in the dragon's uh, shadow. And, um, actually need to stand together or hold hands or fall divided. So I think um, I'll just stop there and I'll thanks, thanks, you Lynn. to follow I mean, up. You talk about strategic options being narrowed even as they're being booked. It's right. But it seems to me there's also a sort of contest of narratives being played out. You know, we're hearing this on in many other sessions around Davos the, this week. On the one hand, you have the, the idea of the free and open uh, Indo-Pacific, you know, rules-based order. On the other, you have the competing idea of uh, Asia for Asians, you know, and this was spelled out during the Global Security Initiative, as, as well as in Xi Jinping's 2014 speech. And just let me repeat to you what he said. Um, it is for the people of Asia to run the affairs of Asia and solve the problems of Asia and uphold the security of Asia. Mm -hmm. Now, tell me how you see that, you know, in, in terms of the competing narratives that you've referred to, challenge or opportunity or a bit of both. Um, I think narratives are so important. So Asia for Asians, um, I would prefer um, to cease talking about, I guess, cultural 
ethnic blocks, right? Mm. The West versus the rest, Asia for Asians. We live in an international community. We talk about the international rules-based order. We talk about international law. Um, I would prefer not to carve out the world in two regions. We are past that. I think history has seen that, done that. Let's, let's move on. We have international law for a re reason. And so I, I think that sort of narrative is is very damaging. And I think if we look at Asia for Asians, um, the problem, of course, is the issue of that balance of power as well. And in Asia, there is a clear, um, clear unbalance, right? We have large country and we have very small countries. Um, and so that doesn't quite work out. And, you know, China often accuses the United States of meddling in the region, etc. But you know, the United States started looking more closely at the issues like the South China Sea in 2010, right? Um, when it, you know, under Secretary Clinton, who was then Secretary of State, she said that the U.S. has national interest in the South China Sea and in freedom of navigation. But even prior to that, the region was facing, very quietly perhaps, but it was nonetheless facing um, concerns about Chinese encroachments into the exclusive economic zones. That's damaging. And then on the other hand, you have the free and open Indo-Pacific, which you talked about. That's a wonderful narrative. And in fact, if we could achieve a free and open Indo-Pacific, that would be perfect, right? That is, in fact, what we should be aiming for, freedom and openness, so that you know, ships can fly the waters of the, uh, of the region and you know, trade and commerce can continue openly and freely. Um, what we do not want to go to is have that as a sort of um, a cover for something that is more confrontational, that is more about you know, achieving dominance of one country over another. And sometimes you know, there are hints of that in even US strategic documents. So the declassified US, uh, US Indo-Pacific strategic framework that was declassified in January 2021, when it, you know, it was the Trump administration handing over to the Biden administration, <coughs> that one in fact highlights um, US goals and state, one of its stated goals is strategic primacy in the Indo-Pacific. That sort of language which is an ideal. Um, and so what we should be looking for, in fact, is a free and open Indo-Pacific, but that not, should not be language for other um, motives. So keeping it inclusive. And Keep it inclusive. I'll, I'll come back to that and maybe get Matthias's comments on that later. But first, I'd like to draw in our business uh, leaders on the panel to get a slightly different perspective. You know. So maybe first Taufik and then Shinta. Maybe you could tell us, you know, as you look around the region, how do we continue to be a thriving region rather than an area where everybody's talking about you know, flashpoints and tensions? Taufik. Um, thanks, Warren. Uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, it's an honor to be on the same stage with uh, such a di uh, distinguished panel. Of course, uh, Excellency Prime Minister Hun Sen. Uh, let's frame ASEAN and probably in the larger context, Asia. I think the whole narrative around Asia being for Asians already implies the region is very deeply misunderstood. And forcing us or painting us into a corner and having to choose between the two ends of this dichotomy, as you've mentioned, just worsens the situation. Uh, as a business, when I attend forums like this, I think just look around you, look at the composition of the people in attendance here, um, not accusing WEF uh, participants of not having the appetite, but just look at it. Just look at it. There's, there's very little appetite to understand the quirks and the idiosyncrasies that we face as individual economies. ASEAN, more than 600 million people, potentially uh, reaching a GDP total of uh, 6 trillion within the next two decades. We're, we're looking at a hive of activity, resource rich, all the potential, a very talented human capital pool. But this has not yet been unleashed, uh, despite all the resources available to it, because nuances such as security are still not held upon as, uh, as uh, something that all the member states need to respect. Um, I, I, I thank uh, His Excellency for, for reiterating in his uh, position as chair the need to have um, a rules-based order. Um, to an unfortunate extent also, I think Dr. Lin also raised the point of this philosophy of non-interference between each state of ASEAN, sometimes creates these nebulous moral debates. Um, should we be promoting more respect for borders. Please, don't take, me as a, don't take me as a representative of the Malaysian government. Well, what I state here is, is, is my own. What I face here, and I'm, I'm front-facing here, I have offshore facilities in the South China Sea. Little known piece of trivia, 
more than 50% of the LNG that powers East Asia goes through South China Sea. The ability to deliver, Petronas has upheld that. We've had a very good track record of delivering up to 12,000 cargoes to our core customers in Japan, Korea, Taiwan, every, China even, uh, starting in the late 1990s. But the questions of security, the questions of ability to uh, freely flow commerce and trade, which you cite, cited at the outset of this uh, dialogue, that continues to be a, a point of worry and concern. Mm -hmm. But of course, when I go on road shows, when I go on uh, um, uh, speaking with investors and partners, uh, even with my team going out to promote Malaysia's bid rounds and developing resources here, this continues to be a question. Now, ASEAN has so much promise. It has suffered through the pandemic. Not everybody's recovering at the same pace. Mm -hmm. Um, why I also want to pick on the, the fact that it is misunderstood. I often see, and I'm already seeing now increasingly in the WF, this uh, emerging narrative of a global south, yet another divide. Why? Because the expectations of ESG that we have to pursue, uh, the expectations of uh, energy transition pace, you're painting it with a very broad brush. Each country, each economy, has its own energy access, energy affordability, energy security concerns. And at a forum such as this, I would have hoped that a spectrum would have been addressed rather than one clear narrative saying, this shall be the pathway. Mm. Petronas has always asserted this. Malaysia has always respected this. Even as 90% of the countries uh, in the world committed at the last COP26 to nationally determined contributions, ASEAN has got its own, its own pace. Now, all of these, and I'm just bring this to a conclusion, all of these stack up to layers of demands, expectations, standards, and unfortunately, it's become polarized even further with the tensions. Choose a side. Mm. Why do we have to choose a side? Uh, the very fact of economic prosperity is available to all, should that not be the premise that, uh, that WF pushes for? I'll conclude there. Well, come back to energy security because it's such a huge issue that's being discussed all around. But first, let me draw in Shinta. Yeah, uh, thank you and thank you for this opportunity. Actually, um, uh, I like to illustrate mine uh, like a traffic lights for ASEAN. So um, I think uh, I'm talking about ASEAN progress and achievement can be symbolized as a green light, you know, to, to be further developed but also um, some geo geopolitical events and geoeconomic shock uh, provide ASEAN with some yellow lights or warning. And of course, the red light sign things that must be stopped and counterbalanced. So I want to give a little bit perspective on some of the positive side that we've done as well, because um, I think in the green light, as ASEAN has uh, moved into a regional entity that uh, uh, highly emphasized uh, in some of the priority issue, global issues, like we're talking about the green-based development at the core, the region effort through the ASEAN Climate and Energy Project um, and 2050 Net Zero Target. Also, uh, we have a working group on uh, climate change. I think has embraced us a more strategic cooperation within um, the environmental champion countries uh, around the globe. The energy demand obviously is very high, but um, finance remains, of course, the critical challenge. And I think this is when we talk about energy transition is the financing aspect, right? So uh, we speak, uh, therefore, fiscal spending, and also how we can leverage private finance with utilization of uh, the regional international funds. But I want to uh, also on the decarbonization net zero economy. I think we are standing uh, with many countries are not in the same level. I agree with Tofik. So when we talk about the decarbonization technology, how we can, you know, uh, put that in, in which perspective and how we can actually. So ma many of the narrative are there, but how can you actually execute it? But I wanna uh, especially also recognize that we have tried very hard to enhance our intra-regional trade and investment cooperation. And this is uh, very much integrated into our global supply chain. I think the ASEAN government recently um, have agreed to push back against globalization and protectionist measure with a more transparency, uh, predatory rule-based and um, open trade and investment system. And I think this, I believe, stand on its right path. But of course, what are the yellow lights? And this is something I think some uh, Dr. Lin also mentioned and Taufik mentioned a little bit, that ASEAN countries have divergent interests 
very sure. And, um, and priorities also, of, con of course, have to be different. And in a way, who are we? we are not, I mean, I know Dr. Lim mentioned ASEAN is not united. Well, each of us have our own interests. And with that also come the competition. You know, every time we talk about Indonesia wanting to push our investment, we always compete ourselves with Vietnam. What Vietnam has done, why Vietnam has been able to attract more investment than Indonesia. So, so you know, I think uh, members have between access and capacity to reap the benefit of our um, integration, but it prompts further challenges. And second, I think we have disparity and income level gap as well. And um, this is how we are um, both exposed with this thing turn out from the regional integration, either from economic production, good services, distribution, and human connectivity. And I can uh, obviously explore more, but you can really see this, um, this I think, uh, gap. And the second thing is um, the dynamic domestic uh, political, political changes also have fundamental impact on the regional economic uh, cooperation. ASEAN has always been strategic for the global and multilateral economic and trade partnership. And uh, we can mention RCEP, we just, you know, signed RCEP, CPTPP, and BRI. And of course, you mentioned about the newest US Indo Pacific economic framework, many. Right, but even with the with the Indo-Pacific, uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific, not all ASEAN countries are participating. Right? They're still not very clear on what this is all. What guinea pig is this? So, those um, I, I think uh, members must work together to obviously strong um, a more credible and uh, well-functioned ASEAN uh, with varying um, different position. But. Um, I wanted to also, I think, na navigate the major power competition effectively. At, I think this is a red flag to how we can avoid the unintended consequences. I think the recent, I have to mention it, uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, crisis remind, remind us not to over-reliance over any countries or goods, services, and capitals, and it could impact the regional um, consumption, supply chain stability, and account balance. So, all members must consistently provide and open to new opportunity, I think, for trade and investment tie with alternative parties. So I think this is what we need to continue working on. But this is definitely a key red, red flag that uh, we need to uh, open our mind. And I think I wanted to also share that at, as the, um, the chairmanship uh, of uh, G20 this year, I think Indonesia, I, I've been tasked to chair the B20. I think we discuss all these issues as well. And we want to align with, because we will, after our presidency this year of the G20, will be the president of ASEAN taking over from Cambodia. So many of these issues also will be aligned as well. Thank you. So some red lights flashing, some yellow and some green as well. So thank you for that, that other perspective as well. But very quickly, you mentioned the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. I'd like to get a quick, brief response from the two business leaders. Is this something you welcome or are you skeptical about it or is it more wait and see? Shinta and then Taufik. Please stop. Oh, <laughs> okay, thank you. Look, when CPTPP first came to Malaysia's shores, even a sector like uh, Petronas, you were looking at promoting competition, but also protecting a degree of uh, nurturing for SMEs, because inevitably SMEs pick up a huge uh, proportion of our respective GDPs. There was a, a, a metered approach in allowing competition to come through. Of course, these are not things that are being imposed upon us to become less competitive or these are draconian measures. We're talking about improving degrees of trade. The very things that we are proposing right now that we would be put under a microscope for ESG. Um, everybody thinks about uh, dealing with emissions front and center, but there's of course the society and also the governance that you need to deal with. And I think it, this offered a pathway. We saw this very early on, at least in Petronas level, um, having to deal with emissions, having to deal with labor standards, having to allow for competition. We see this, we anticipate it, and we have to prepare for it. That is the very nature of open economies and joining such multilateral uh, trade agreements. You just have to make sure you're robust enough, resilient enough, which should be at the core of every commercial enterprise. Uh, but 
it is not without the risk of unintended consequences. Okay, so it sounds like you welcome it, but with some caveat. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I have to share this story because this is really fun. Be before uh, the, the actual summit, the US ASEAN summit, so we, I brought the business, Indonesian business delegation, and we met with a number of go uh, government officials in the US, including um, US trade, you know, US commerce, and so forth, um, USTR, US commerce, and, and, and they, of course, mentioned about the Indo Pacific framework agreement. And the question is, what is it, right? And I, I you know, I really like the narrative because in the narrative clearly said, you know, connected economy, resilient economy, clean economy, fair economy. Wow, I said, this is amazing. But what's in it for the business? How is this going to impact the business, right? right. So I think there's still very much unclearness. Of course, uh, it seems that US seems to be committed and say, we will invest. So the word wants to invest already give us a very big optimism. Oh, that means US will invest to us, right? And, but I think there is no max, market happens. This is not like a regular negotiated trade agreement. So there's still very unclearness. So I would say mm. that our position is we are open-minded. We want to hear more what it is, but what's in it for us, okay. for business? Open-minded, but let's see what's in it for us. Okay, let me bring in Matthias now. You've been waiting very patiently. <laughs> but as someone watching all of this discussion and all this playing out in our region, what's your sense? Well, the first point, sort of picking up on the question that you posed at the beginning, uh, is that um, you know, ASEAN very clearly is a thriving region in its own right. I, mean, I think we should be uh, very clear about that. I mean, the, the uh, successes that ASEAN uh, have achieved, I mean, ASEAN as a whole is the fifth uh, largest economy in the world, with home to about 660 million people. And, and ASEAN is made up of successful export-focused uh, trading uh, nations, and ASEAN has its own interest uh, in uh, well-functioning global markets, uh, in a rules-based uh, international system in good working order. So from where I sit, it's not so much about picking sides, it's about advancing uh, its own interest uh, in well-functioning global markets, a rules-based international trading system. And, and in terms of you know, how, how has ASEAN and, and economies across ASEAN achieved the incredible uh, progress in rising uh, incomes, in uh, reducing poverty, uh, it's through, uh, yes, uh, increased regional market integration, it's, but it's also through increased uh, integration into the global market. It's uh, through trade and investment uh, liberalization. And, and on that front, on all of these fronts, I think that there is uh, further that ASEAN uh, economies can go to further strengthen the opportunities. I mean, countries around the world uh, were thrown back, uh, you know, of, of course, in, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, and, you know, one of the key risks uh, across ASEAN uh, and the rest of the world, for that matter, is to continue to do everything uh, we can to stay on top of the uh, pandemic risk in the context of potential new variants. But, but beyond that, um, I mean, th th there is a lot of untapped potential still to unleash private sector-driven growth. Uh, through uh, regulatory reforms. I mean, even just looking at the logistics arrangements out of ASEAN, which are so important for export-focused trading uh, economies, uh, you know, a, a regulatory refresh could substantially boost uh, economic growth. And, and that, that is not about uh, taking sides. This is not about anything geostrategic. <coughs> this is essentially just good uh, economic reform, uh, good domestically, uh, good, good focus um, structural reform. Um, in terms of uh, competition policy, in terms of making sure that there's a level playing field between state-owned enterprises and, and, and private sector businesses and so on, there's, there's a whole range of areas where I think um, where, where I think ASEAN can go even further and, and to further advance the regional market in integration and the integration into uh, the global economy, I think, um, you know, are all important aspects of ASEAN's future success. But, but our assessment of uh, ASEAN's uh, growth uh, into the future is you know, very, very optimistic. Thank you, Matthias. I think at last night's uh, ASEAN dinner. เอ่อขนมกัดมาหาทางยกมั้ยคืออาเซียนคือถือการรวมคณะเจรจาแล้วถ้ายิงตัดถือการเอฟไซต์ติดอันใบเอ่อสมบัติบ้านสมรรถภ
I'd like to get a sense from the two business leaders on the panel. How do you see those challenges playing out in the next few weeks, months, and, and years ahead for ASEAN? I mean, I see, you know, we talk about, there's talk about oil palm restrictions, and now there's a chicken spat between Malaysia and Indonesia on, uh, and, and Singapore on, on chicken exports. How can ASEAN work together to get through these challenges on energy and food and cost of living? Jita, you want to start? Or? No, please go ahead. Um, this is something that's probably, again, an alien concept, which is why I, I, an alien concept to the denizens in, in WF. We often talk about the long play, the next decade, in many households, hundreds of millions of households in Asia, in parts of it in ASEAN. They're not talking about the next decade. They're talking about next week. Can I put food on the table next week? I mentioned at the outset, affordable, accessible, uh, secure energy still remains uh, a top concern for many of the governments in, in, in ASEAN. Something like Ukraine happens, and, and this, this is real. Yeah, I think uh, we're talking about 40% of the gas into Europe being removed from the system, three to four million barrels of production, making its way in different routes uh, to the market. Uh, we're looking at, as I, as I spoke to the press yesterday, $111 rent. We now have a, com a combination of this um, energy pushed inflation combined with commodity scarcity. Uh, countries have responded by either restricting exports. Um, we've lost wheat out of Ukraine. Uh, all of this has converged. And what worries me in, in, in Davos is there's already whisperings of increasing deglobalization. Yes, keep hearing that word. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, 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 and I, I think at a time like this, and, and you've almost answered your own question there, Warren. At a time like this, it's collaboration that's going to get us through. Yeah. Cyclicality within energy is getting to a point where it's ridiculous. I was quoted in Sierra Week by saying it's bedlam because there's no fundamentals to this anymore. It doesn't make sense. Uh, we're there to ensure reliable uh, supply of energy to our customers. But if you ask me, ask any energy CEO, what prices are going to be next month, forget next year, most of us will get it wrong. Um, when, Combine this with the complexities of uh, a food ecosystem, which is under threat. No gas means no urea, no fertilizers, no farm feed. The knock-on effects are immense. We're all part of a global supply chain. Now, the more these whisperings of deglobalization emerge, the more regions are compelled to col collaborate, and more and more the philosophy of regionalization is emerging. And in ASEAN's context, in fact, the trade routes, the, uh, the connections, uh, the trade relations have already been deep for a very long time. Mm. We can remain resilient. I think uh, in, in so far as uh, the context of energy, food, there just needs to be more openness, more coordination and collaboration. Easier said than done. This has to be done across uh, jurisdictions and sovereign nations, uh, all dealing with their own distinct and unique challenges for society. But we do know what happened in the Middle East when energy and food prices converged. And many times this has been cited, it led to an Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. Let's not allow this to happen in ASEAN, if I may, uh, yeah, if I may implore everyone. So, uh, Lynn wants to come in on that, but I'll get Shin yeah, to you yeah, on, on no, this no. issue of deglobalization and yeah, diversification. Exactly. I, I wanted to, to, to say, right, I mean, it's, it's basically what, what uh, Cliff say. it's easier said than done, right? Mm. We do want to collaborate. I mean, we want to put the regional um, uh, co uh, cooperation and so forth. But at the end, each government has to protect their own, you know, we talk about uh, food, we talk about energy. That's really a priority, right? So, so, so I, I, I'm thinking there are two as aspects that I would like to see as the more medium long term risk as well. Um, first, this is stagflation, obviously. Um, could, <laughs> I think so much it costs very, you know, stagnating or even declining real economic growth or employment growth. I think this condition might happen if um, there's a continuously um, high or higher inflation uh, throughout 2022. And this obviously will continue disruption of our global value change and rise in, in commodity prices we're already seeing. But the other thing that I wanted to 
uh, uh, mentioned is there is definitely a geopolitical uh, polar, polarized GF, uh, the global value chain reorganization. And I think depends on how this conflict progressing, there might be a real long-term risk of having a polarized global economy based on uh, geopolitical alliances or solidarity. And this has to be, I think, uh, really underlined. I was even thinking about like a Cold War, right? Uh, given to the tendency of country throwing and accumulating sanctions um, to each other, while at the same time increasing neglecting rules of the multilateral uh, um, trading system. So US, EU, and it's I refocusing even the MFN uh, treatment to Russia. So all this, I think, try to pull and push other countries to be pro or against will definitely impact this, uh, you know, the global value chain, ASEAN position. Really, uh, I think we need to really pay attention to this. Okay. Briefly, I'll give Lynn the last word on this because we are running out of time on this strategic issue on other fronts. Well, I just wanted to respond to some of the points that were made earlier um, by the business leaders. And I've heard a lot about, you know, the the necess necessity, the imperative of economic growth and development, etc. And I fully share that view. Um, however, I think economic growth is built on the backbone of an international rules-based order, which has international law at its heart. We have Petronas represented on the panel, and I, th I believe it was just last year when uh, Petronas had sent the West Capella, which is a, a, a ship that surveyed for oil and gas within Malaysia's exclusive economic zone. But Petronas, but the West Capella, yep. unfortunately, faced harassment from Chinese vessels that were seeking um, to stop or deter Malaysia from drilling for or surveying for oil and gas in Malaysia's own exclusive economic zone. So in a sense, you cannot have growth and development without you know, proper security, without security and an international rules-based order. Uh, so that's the first point I'd like to make. The second point I'd like to make is, yes, countries should not have to choose. I do not disagree with that. However, it cannot be about inactively or being really passive about things. Countries do have to stand for something. And I take Shinta's point that, you know, all the Southeast Asian countries have got diverse interests, yes, and they're sometimes competitors as well. But I think there is a shared interest in principles and a shared interest that, you know, they need to be in an environment where they can have a situation where it's not about might is right but it's about the rule of law. And I think that's very important. I think Southeast Asia or in ASEAN need to focus and have strategic unity in terms of like, we don't want to choose, but we do stand for something. And what we stand for is about principles and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. So shared principles and shared interest in trying to build on that. I'm afraid we've run out of time. So I'm going to turn to the, our Prime Minister Hun Sen, who's been listening intently throughout. And maybe you can give us your closing thoughts, your takeaways from this discussion that you will bring back to ASEAN in your role as a chair. Please, Prime Minister. Thank you very much. I don't know how much time do I have uh, because you have taken a lot of my time already. And I saw only two minutes remaining. However, I have uh, the role to take some notes on the discussed issues. First of all, we should see that ASEAN is a community which is in the situation where uh, got the impact from the outside. Of course, uh, what we agreed here is that we took note on not to take side with anybody. I uh, take note that our friends who are superpowers also told us that the, it is not necessary to take part with anyone. And we also emphasize that although you ask us to take side, we will not do so. However, uh, this Dr. Lin from Singapore also mentioned that we do not take side, but we also have a, a position, for example, on the uh, trade, we we cannot just take not take side, but not working with anyone. Uh, what I want to add is that the geopolitical rivalry makes 
as in a lot of difficulties. The point is that now we see the Indo-Pacific uh, initiatives. How many of these initiatives? Indo-Pacific of US, of Australia, of Japan, Indo-Pacific initiative of Europe, and other initiatives uh, related in the region. But for me, I announced in principle that in any initiative related to Indo-Pacific must serve three purposes, uh, whether we should uh, support or not. Number one, that should serve for peace, security, and development. This is number one. Uh, number two, uh, not against any country, because we are not uh, aligned with anyone. Uh, number three, it must serve the ASEAN centrality, because ASEAN centrality, we remember clearly that uh, that was the initiative from Indonesia who prepared the ASEAN outlook uh, on the Indo-Pacific, which has become a working plan of the ASEAN. So we also have the uh, Indo-Pacific initiative. We don't just ASEAN support others, but others should also support ASEAN initiative. This is what I want to raise here. Uh, don't just see that ASEAN follow others. Any uh, outside mechanism from ASEAN, we need to be cautious because they say they respect ASEAN centrality. But if ASEAN just support others and others do not support ASEAN initiative, so what is the point on the AUKUS or Quad? These are also related to us. We should also take into account the issue. Of course, there's different uh, interpretations. Even though at, uh, in DC, there was some people who should not say it, but they said that. On, on the court, because court is not as an initial mechanism, but at the end of the discussion, Indonesia is the coordinating country between ASEAN and the United States. Cambodia is the ASEAN chair. Uh, relating to the court initiative uh, fighting against the COVID-19 uh, regarding the vaccines, because we don't want to have any uh, alignment and against the others. But on the other issue is that on the South China Sea, of course, South China Sea is a process. There are challenges and uh, some uh, good points. This is the 20th anniversary of the, uh, the signing on the DOC the declaration on the parties uh, to the South China Sea. We also uh, are promoting uh, the uh, COC. Uh, what Cambodia has raised uh, so far, and uh, the process, the point is that we need to respect the, the DOC. DOC clearly states that uh, about the uh, freedom of navigation over flight and the UNCLOS 1982. So first, we need to have the full and effective implementation of the DOC. And uh, secondly, the related parties have to be uh, at utmost restraint because Cambodia is not a claiming country but Cambodia want to see bilateral uh, uh, the, uh, resettlement if they can do. And uh, number three, we need to uh, create the COC for the South China Sea. And we try our effort to make it this year, but we don't know how much hope remains. We encourage more negotiation between ASEAN and China. 
I even announced that I can uh, provide the five yard, uh, the five star hotel of high yard for negotiation place, but no nobody show any willingness to come to Phnom Penh for negotiation. I I will bear the burden. Uh, I hired the five star hotel for ASEAN China negotiation for the COC. So this is something should be raised. And lastly, I want to emphasize, and actually not the last one, but uh, the flashing point uh, uh, relevant to what has happened uh, uh, while COVID-19 uh, crisis, Myanmar is very hot issue. South China Sea is very issue, hot issue. But a few days ago, I told, I told the in ASEAN US special summit, I said that I am the ASEAN chair this year as if I received the hot stone, not the hot potato. If hot potato I can eat, but hot hot stone on Myanmar, on other issues, but the severe issue is the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. That is the most severe uh, problem for us. Because if during the COVID-19 start to East Cambodia today is the 17th day where zero infection case has happened. After the pouring of vaccination of more, almost 94% of coverage uh, rate. But the effect of this war between Ukraine and Russia uh, is a very severe uh, problem. Uh, this is actually not a global military war, but the, the economic war starts because you see uh, the price of fuel start to rise everywhere. Even though Petronas producing oil, you cannot make, you cannot sell at the a cheaper price than the global market. So now we are entering the uh, energy crisis. I see t whether 2023 could be a f food crisis year because the wheat production now have the problems. I hope that in ASEAN, not so severe, relatively, because almost half of ASEAN members producing rice. However, with this food crisis, it also creates a challenge for us. Therefore, if we don't find the solution quickly on the Russian invasion in Ukraine, this will prolong and create more severe crisis. I am uh, in agreement with the Madame from Indonesia. Uh, now, the countries who do not directly involve uh, with the problem, with the problem, we are facing the dilemma. One, on one hand, the U Ukraine Russian issue. The other one is the sanction sanction should be stopped because it doesn't create any benefit. Even if the country putting sanction also affected, not only the poor countries, the countries put or impose sanction on, on Russia, what do they get back? This is the problem. I give you an example. If Russia cut off uh, gas to Europe, whether what what is the alternative? Whether you cut wood to cook rice to cook your food. If so, this is not the point where Russia cut off all gas yet. But now, what has imp exported to Russia and out of Russia is compared to the closing of the door. If you close the door, you cannot get out, and the other cannot get in. So the sanction impacted us who are not directly involved. So this is the problem which is created out of sanction. So lastly, that, that I want to raise here for ASEAN, uh, this year 
we have made our effort as what I have uh, raised. But we need to take the opportunity to uh, promote integration through AFTA framework, through a free trade agreement between ASEAN and other partners, including uh, ASEP, which has been uh, into force. Uh, when uh, COVID started in ASEAN, we took separate measures, separate measures. We closed the borders, but now ASEAN start to coordinate together on how to open borders and open uh, trade. The trade volume between Cambodia and other ASEAN members, uh, especially neighboring countries, have been increasing. This is a complementarity within the trade uh, economic relation. So we should take this year as a good year because ASEAN is held in Cambodia, G20 in Indonesia, and APEC to be held in Thailand. So we need to seize the opportunity out of this. Thank you. Prime Minister, for dealing with all those hot stones and hot potatoes. I think we have to wrap up. Please thank all my panelists. Thank you very much.